So when it comes to the jinn, it's a very serious topic for us to study. Obviously, it has implications for us as well to know who the jinn are, what they represent, what their purpose is, and you know, whatever it is about them that Allah or the Messenger وسلم, mentioned to us about them. Obviously, we know that they're created from fire, but they're not just created from any form of fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَلَقَ الْجَانَّ مِن مَارِجٍ مِن نَّارٍ The Prophet وسلم, the way he described that is that they were created from a smokeless flame. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that they were created min taraf al from the edge of the flame, which is the best of it. So Allah is actually mentioning it to them in Surah Al-Rahman as a favor to them. And that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that just as He created man from the finest molding of clay, He fashioned man, humankind, from the finest molding of clay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashioned jinn from the finest molding of fire overall. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal min qablu min nar as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them before us. Now linguistically, jinn comes from the word jana. And jana means that which is concealed. And subhanAllah, it's interesting because at one point in life, linguistically, don't misunderstand me here. Linguistically, we were all jinn. Linguistically, not technically. We we're always human beings, but linguistically. Because Allah says in the Quran, إِذْ أَنْتُمْ أَجِنَّةٌ فِي بُطُونِ أُمْهَاتِكُمْ When you were concealed in your mother's wombs, which is why a miscarried fetus would be called jinnin. Okay, so jinn means that which is hidden, that which is concealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ That verily, shaytan and his soldiers and his troops, they see you in ways that you can't see them. So they're concealed from us as human beings and that's a test for us and that's a favor that they have, that they can see us but we can't see them. Animals can see them. So obviously we're greater than animals as far as our creation is concerned, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us by concealing them from us. And that's actually why, one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon us clothes, because most of the scholars said that the jinn don't actually even have that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, O son of Adam, O children of Adam, Qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum, that verily we have bestowed upon you clothing so that you could cover yourselves, warisha, and so that you could also adorn yourselves. So part of it is that we cover ourselves in front of one another, and that also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us something to conceal ourselves in front of the jinn that are around us that we're unable to see. Now obviously in that fascination of jinn, subhanAllah, likewise we have a lot of theological deviations. So you'll find that the mushrikeen, the pagans of Mecca, as we mentioned, they called the angels the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, banatul rahman. They also went so far to call the jinn the brothers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they assign a gender to the angels, which is obviously inappropriate because the angels have no gender. And then they assume that all the jinn are men, and even worse, they're the brothers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so obviously Allah is free from the jinn and free from anything um, in that regard. The jinn do have genders. They're a male jinn and they're a female jinn. The Christians, on the other hand, they don't actually believe in a separate creation of jinn. In Judeo-Christian thought, they're all just fallen angels. The entire concept of demons is a race of fallen angels. And obviously, as believers, you know, as Muslims, we separate between the angels and the jinn altogether, which is something that we view as a mistake theologically um, in Judeo-Christian thought. Now, what it is about the jinn is that they are mukallafun. They're just like us as human beings. They're mukallafun, which means that they are responsible for their actions. They have free will just like human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that the jinn said to the Prophet that we have some amongst us that are believers, that have submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have some amongst us that are you know, rebellious transgressors, that have rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the shaytan, okay, like the devil himself, and so on and so forth. So there are different categories, but their purpose is in essence the same purpose as human beings. Allah says, I did not create jinn or mankind except to worship me. So some of them choose to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like human beings do, and some of them choose to rebel. And they're mentioned in various ways in the sunnah. So not necessarily with ranks, but with various names. And even in the Quran sometimes, you'll see the word, for example, afriyat. And afriyat refers to a very strong jinn. Rasulullah once when he was praying, he caught a afrit, he actually caught one of the very strong jinn. And the Prophet وسلم, he thought to tie that strong jinn uh, to a pillar in the masjid, but then the Prophet وسلم, he let him go. So the word afrit is used sometimes in the Quran and Sunnah to refer to a very powerful jinn. Likewise, you have shayateen, the devils, which obviously it's pretty self-explanatory. Any evil jinn is referred to as a shaytan, and they are the shayateen. Then you have an interesting word, which is the word awamir. And awamir are the jinn that tend to live within the homes. 
Okay, so they're the jinn that tend to settle within homes. Obviously coming from, you know, Amr is someone that takes up residence and that sets up somewhere. And that's what they refer to in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in that regard. And that's how the Arabs used to refer to them as well. When they refer to a jinn that was inside the home, they use the word Awamr, okay? Now obviously this entire realm, whether they're good jinn or bad jinn, you know, we're to show aversion to them as a whole. We're not supposed to interact with this realm. We're not supposed to take steps to try to reach out to good jinn or so on and so forth because we don't really know. In essence, our interaction is limited so we wouldn't even be able to tell who's truly a good jinn and who's truly an evil jinn. And some people make that mistake of trying to actually communicate with good jinn to do good things and it actually ends up backfiring on them because that jinn that they were communicating with turned out to be not so good. So we're supposed to try to avoid that realm as much as we can in general and obviously take steps in our lives to ward off the evil amongst them and not to imitate their habits as well, the evil habits amongst them. So the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he said, when one of you eats, let him eat with his right hand. Uh, and when he drinks, let him drink with his right hand. Because the shayateen, they eat with their left hands and they drink with their left hands. Okay, so the Prophet ﷺ is telling us to avoid being like them in that regard, avoid imitating the shayateen, avoid imitating the evil jinn, and also obviously take the steps to protect ourselves from them and from their harm. Shaytan is an exception in that he lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him respite and he lives for a very long time. Otherwise, the dua of the Prophet ﷺ that we mentioned very early on, Anta al-hayyu ladhi la yamut wal jinnu wal insu yamutun. You are al hay you are the ever-living who never dies. And both jinn and human beings die. In fact, you know, not only do they die, they have janazas, they have graves, they have funerals, they have cultures, they have languages, they have genders, they procreate. So unlike the angels who are just perpetually being created, the jinn actually marry and have children. They have the riya, as Allah tells us in the Quran, they have offspring, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also established some of their attributes in the Quran. So Allah has established their nadhar, Allah has established that they can see, Allah has established al-qawl, that they can speak, and Allah has established a summer that they can hear. All of these things are attributed to the jinn in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also, as he mentions to us in the story of Sulaiman, that the jinn, you know, what we can take from that is that the jinn are able to move much quicker and with far more ease than we are as human beings. They're able to fly, they're able to travel through the skies, they're able to move a lot faster and to get things done a lot faster than us and to be in one place and another place far faster than we are, as is evidenced in many different uh, stories of the Prophet and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They also have a more fluid creation in the sense that their shapes can be very different. They can assume many shapes. Okay, so obviously, you know, assuming that they can fly would mean that, you know, or we know that they can fly or that they can reach the sky, so maybe they have wings. But, you know, we also know that, again, the Prophet ﷺ mentions to us, sometimes they take an animal shape, sometimes they can even take a human shape. And the Prophet ﷺ, you know, obviously encountered the shaytan once as a human being. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he once encountered the shaytan, the devil, as a human being. Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was tempted in the places of the Jamarat, where we stone today, he was tempted by the devil who was in the form of a man. Even the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, the very famous incident of Darul Nadwa, where shaytan came in the form of a human being and suggested to them how to kill the Prophet ﷺ, and then made them the promise in Badr uh, that they would defeat the Prophet ﷺ and the believers, and so on and so forth. So the jinn and their shape, though we can't really draw out a jinn and see how they would look, but they're very fluid in their shape and they're able to assume different forms. Just as the jinn have right upon us, their animals have right upon us as well. So again, it's a very interesting realm, it's a very different realm, but at the end of the day, their purpose is like ours, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to overcome desire and temptation and abilities that have been given to them to do that which is right. And subhanAllah, something very powerful here, Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that, you know, it's been established that the jinn will have more evil amongst them than human beings. And he said, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them more abilities. And when you couple more ability with desire, so they might have the same level of desire as we have as human beings, but when you couple the ability, and then you couple obviously that with the evil of shaitan, then there's more room for them to become corrupt. So there will be a greater portion of jinn that would be punished on the day of judgment than human beings. And we ask Allah to protect us all.